What's up, family? It is so good to see you. This is the Endangered Species Unapologetically Podcast, your neighborhood barbershop that is full of news, politics, and informed conversations. You know how we do in the shop. We are forging a fair and just world by telling our own stories right here. My name is Devon Morris. I'm man in the last chair in the back of the room. So be like my play cousin. Come on in. Play some games. Talk your ish and enjoy yourself. We got a chair coming up for you next. Hello, everyone. Welcome again. This is episode nine. In today's episode, we're talking about all black lives matter. Now, why is this a topic? Because as a member of the African diaspora, I feel we are disconnected from the rest of the black folks on the planet. So the idea is that from an ideological standpoint, period, All Black Lives Matter. We need to reconnect to that and make that happen. But before we talk about any of that, we jump into the rest of our topics. I do want to talk about some new stuff because we have been doing that all all throughout every single one of these actual episodes. And what I'm going to start at is real simple with um, something that concerns us in the U.S., around the world, really. Um, But in the U.S., it's kind of interesting because... The actual COVID cases have been going up and up and up and up. Uh, This past week, we have reached a seven-day, the seven-day highest average of COVID cases, um, at least new COVID cases, since the pandemic has started, right? That right there is a whole nother problem. I mean, it's a whole and different type of problem. Now... I say this because I am concerned about the second wave. I'm not really concerned about me. You know, I think I had COVID like literally before they announced COVID or they knew about it in January. I think I had it in December. Uh, but the idea is simple. If you think about a county like El Paso, the county of El Paso here in in, in Texas. Uh, They actually are at a point, and and, and I don't believe we hit the worst yet. They are at a point where they have reached 100% capacity in the hospitals. Now, if you remember from the beginning, we were talking about smash the curve. Not just we want to just blow it out. We want to smash the curve. Now, why do we want to smash the curve? Because ultimately, what happens is there is a place where there is the healthcare system to be able to take care of us. And the number of people hitting that system is important because if we go above that, that's when we have to start making life and death type of decisions for people uh, that arrive with these conditions, right? And so we don't want to get past that threshold of where the hospital or the healthcare system can handle the amount of cases that are coming in. Because not just COVID, right? I've had family members that have died over this time frame, and, and it wasn't from COVID. It was from other things, right? So now we're talking about the decisions about beds at that particular point in time. And when you say that El Paso is putting in, at least El Paso County is, is putting in measures now to have curfews and everything else because their hospital system is at the point where it could collapse. They're at 100% now, and that's going to go up as cases get worse, right? We've been talking time and time again about the second wave of COVID actually happening. And um, I am concerned about that. And it's going to limit my moves a whole lot because I have a daughter that has a birthday. I'm going to have to find a way to get and see her and hug her up for a birthday and really probably not have to be around any family whatsoever. And I'm probably going to have to stay in a hotel or do something so that I can make sure I'm only seeing her and go see people maybe once because normally I got places I would stay when I go into the city of Chicago. So it, it's it's one of those things where I'm very, very concerned. And then, you know, You add to that news other things, other things like the fact that 
Trump had COVID. Now it comes out that Pence, the vice president of the United States of America, has COVID, and he has two, three people. They won't even give us the name of the other people that infected. They won't give us the total numbers. And he wasn't, or at least as of today, from what I know, he has just decided to scale back some of his travel, and we can't even guarantee that. So they are arguing about him being an essential worker and him needing to go campaign on the campaign trail. I mean, can you imagine? I mean, I, I cannot imagine going to see somebody who I know has COVID, who I know hasn't fully recovered from COVID, but even if they act like they do, we ain't hanging out for another 14 days, at least, right? So they are really treating this with Pence like it's a non-existent. You know, some of the stuff that you hear coming out the White House, um, there's a quote, right? White House Chief of Staff Mark Meadows saying in an interview um, with CNN that the U.S. is not going to control the coronavirus pandemic. Now, look, there have been other countries that have controlled the pandemic, no question. Other countries have absolutely controlled the pandemic. So why can't the U.S. control the pandemic? Is it because we don't really have a plan? Is it because we're not following science? There's all kinds of reasons that we can all put forth on why it's not happening. But the truth of the matter is we are in this situation and we're going to have to find some way to deal with this great leveler of this society because we are we have a reckoning ahead of us. No question. No, no doubt about that. And you have to remember the other side of the equation. Black folk, you are the frontline workers. You are the essential workers, right? Black folk are predominantly at the front line. So we are going to be exposed to this more than anybody else, which means that our people will have the opportunity to catch COVID at a higher rate, at a higher rate. I mean, I have friends that are bus drivers, friends that work in the post office, friends that do this, friends that do that. And disproportionately, my friends are frontline workers. Disproportionately, right? It's just facts, no if, ands, or buts to that. So it is a concern with this next wave of the coronavirus actually happening, okay? Now, it goes back to a simple place. There was another White House staffer that said that um, mask, wearing a mask was, or talking about wearing a mask was like telling jokes. You know, if you have science that is saying to you, look, wear a mask, wear a mask, wear a mask, wearing a mask can help. It's the only thing we know of right now that can help outside of having a vaccine or some other way of actually eliminating this thing and curing this thing. So they're really saying that to us, right? They're saying it to us over and over again. You know, I've heard Trump say it time and time again. Fauci said this at one point. Fauci changed his mind a long time ago. And so when I got the Fauci talking like the godfather, it's a whole different problem. So literally, people, keep yourself safe out there. Keep yourself safe. If you are a frontline worker. Do everything in your power to keep yourself and your family as COVID-free as possible. Why do I say that? Because I can't say for you to stop going to make the money that you need to make for you to be able to feed yourself because, unfortunately, stimulus packages and things for that for the American people just is not happening. Our government is not moving at a pace or a rate or anything to help people survive this thing in a working perspective. It is almost more important for people to get back on their jobs so and then businesses can make money so we can make the rich richer. So if you're one of those disproportionately black people, forget black people for a second. Anybody, man, anybody. If you're a frontline worker, protect yourself. Protect yourself. Protect yourself. You know, uh, Governor Christie, New Jersey, said he let down his guard for one moment. He was in that little garden, chopping it up, having conversations, no mask on, and bam, COVID hit him hard, right? So, again, I say to you, protect yourself, protect yourself, protect yourself. I cannot phrase it any better than protect yourself. And why is that? Because I can't guarantee that they're going to protect you. You know, and, and a lot of us have this feeling that once they um, put one of those tubes down your throat, 
you on the way out. You're on the way out. So you want to do everything in your power to not get into that place, to not get into that place whatsoever. So we're in a very trying time right now, and I, and I think you need to look out for yourself as much as you possibly can during this second wave. And, you know, this is something that I, I, I can't say that I really want to talk about, but I have no choice but to talk about. Uh, wear your mask. Do everything in your power. Wear your mask. Uh, protect others, you know. At this point, even if I go through the drive through at a restaurant, I am actually putting my mask on. Not because of them protecting me, because they're mostly wearing their mask. They're wearing their mask, right? Some may have it over, not over their nose like they're supposed to, but they're wearing their mask, right? I'm putting it on me so I can protect me from them and them from me, right? So I'm like doing a double thing here. So I'm doing that out of courtesy for them in terms of them being frontline workers. So, I mean, I've tested, uh, and I, I didn't test positive for the coronavirus, um, but I'm never going to call it the China virus. You know, I, I, I keep hearing that coming from my president, and that just, I, I get it, I understand why we don't, don't want to say it that way, but our cases are ridiculous. You know, I look at the case numbers, and next after us is India, and India has so many more people. So it is one of those things where it's like, wow. We're still, we're still having this conversation in today's world. Um, it's wild, okay? So that being said, take care of yourself. Make sure, you, make sure you're good. Make sure you're good. Um, another thing that is up in the news, and it's definitely up in the news um, on, on this day as you're getting back to work in the beginning of this week, uh, by the time this is released, Amy Coney Barrett, will have been confirmed as the as a Supreme Court justice. Okay? Uh they spent the entire weekend. I mean I don't know if they spent the entire weekend, but they had special sessions over the weekend to make sure they can do all the things that they needed to do so they can actually have this vote. Now tomorrow, you know, um well on a day that this is going to be released on, um Next week will be November 3rd. will be the day we need to go and actually vote. At least a lot of people will go out and vote. So if your state has started voting, please get out there and vote as soon as possible. Try to go in person. I've seen people. I saw a viral video of this lady, black lady, talking about what she had to take with her to go vote, man. She had snacks. She had drinks. She had an umbrella, too, man. And that whole thing went viral. So I enjoy seeing uh, some lady from Texas. So that was enjoyable to see. But when I actually went out to vote, I, that's what I saw. That's what I saw. Older folks with chairs, snacks, drinks, umbrella. I've seen it all, man. I've seen it all when I went out there to vote. Uh, so make sure you get out there and vote. Um, but in terms of that Senate vote, um, in, in terms of that, that legislative branch voting, they're going to vote her in. There's no question. They got the votes uh, at this point in time um, before they take the vote. I've only heard, I only heard one one Republican to say they, they they wasn't with the program. You know, when you see Mitt Romney agree with it, <laughs> when you see Senator Mitt Romney agree with anything that has to do with Trump, you know that the Republicans got it at that point. When he, he when he agrees with anything from Trump, you know that they got it at that point. So in, at this point in time, you know, Amy Barrett, uh, Justice Barrett, soon to be, will be a Supreme Court justice. And now they will take that number from that 8 to that 9 so then they won't have any deadlocks whatsoever. So it's interesting. And uh, what's going to be even more interesting is um, if Biden wins uh, and he becomes President Biden, the big thing that's on the table right now, the big thing that Trump keeps bringing up is the Supreme Court number changing. Um, they have a virtual lock in terms of the Supreme Court, in terms of conservative uh, justices plus uh, in general the court across America uh, being conservative with the 200 people that Trump had put in place over his time frame, his just four years in office. So he's had a tremendous impact in terms of what's going to happen in terms of America for the next decade or so. For the next decade. Not dec I would say decades, right? Not decades, decades. So just know that, that these political things are happening. And we see this, we see them have a weekend session when the first stimulus packages would come around. They wouldn't even get in session. They wouldn't even call the session. 
they wouldn't even do anything. And they're doing a lot of things virtually. They couldn't even do that stuff in order for them to approve the second stimulus package. Matter of fact, that second stimulus package still is not approved. And we, we get a justice that is going to be approved in less time than it's taken for them to deal with that. That definitely concerns me in reference to this whole thing. There was a couple of quotes that was thrown out that I want to throw, that I want to just mention to you. Um, this quote right here, the Senate is doing the right thing. We're moving this nomination forward and colleagues by tomorrow night, we will have a new member of the United States Supreme Court. This was Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. That's what he said this past Sunday. So literally, um, by the time this podcast is available, you will have a new Justice of the Supreme Court. No questions, no ifs, ands, or buts to it. I didn't. There's no quivering in his voice whatsoever. Um, and then you also hear from the other side. The Republican Party is willing to ignore the pandemic to rush the Supreme Court nomination forward. That was from Senator Leader Chuck Schumer. Uh, so you just see this battle happening back and forth. But as Mer Americans, um, you know, those are just politics. What I'm concerned about is I'm concerned about what's happening with people on the ground. Um, and for you, you black folks, I want you to know that Amy Corner Barrett, uh, she was actually replaced a black lady. Uh, when, when there was a black lady, I forget her name, my, uh, I'll get it for you next time. But she was actually put up to be at that seventh court, uh, circuit. Um, and what happened is Trump let that expire and put Amy Coney Barrett up and then, uh, the rest is history. So just understand there's been a tremendous impact in terms of you getting out the vote or not going out the vote. Uh, so make sure you get out there and get that vote in. Um, but, that's not what we're going to talk about this particular session. So what I want to do is I'm going to go ahead and uh, jump into uh, what is really the topic. And I like to make sure you uh, learn about this little story, a story where many of you probably have some relations, well, relationships that go back that you may not even know of. And um, I'll let you enjoy that story right now. This is the colonial history of Nigeria. Nigeria is a large, densely populated West African country off the Gulf of Guinea with a population of about 200 million people. It comprises about 924,000 square kilometers or about 575,000 miles of land and is bordered by a few neighbors, Benin, Niger, Chad, Cameroon. The largest city in Nigeria is Lagos, but the capital is Abuja. Primary languages spoken are Yoruba, Hausa, Igbo, and English to name a few. The name Nigeria, which means Niger area, was coined on January 8, 1897 in the London Times by a British journalist, Flora Shaw. Miss Shaw would later marry a British colonial administrator Lord Frederick Lugar. On January 1st, 1914, Lord Lugard, the governor of both Northern Nigeria Protectorate and the Colony and Protectorate of Southern Nigeria, signed a document consolidating the two, thereby creating the Colony and Protectorate of Nigeria. The predominantly Muslim North and Christian South were combined into one country for administrative ease. Lord Lugard referred to it as a marriage between the poor husband of the North and the rich wife of substance and means from the South in order to create a happy life. The stain of this decision still impacts Nigeria to this very day as one of the largest black African nations on earth. Here is the popular history of Nigeria from the perspective of the colonizer. 1472, Portuguese navigators reached the Nigerian coast. Portuguese actually brought Christianity with them. From the 16th century through the 18th century, you would see the slave trade dominate this region. 
where Nigerians were forced to go to the Americas. 1809, the Islamic Sokoto Caliphate is founded in the north. 1850s, the British established some presence around Lagos. 1861 and 1914, the British consolidates its hold over what is called the colony and protectorate of Nigeria and governs through local leaders. Now let's break that down a little bit to help you understand it better because it didn't happen overnight. 1861, that's when the British occupied Lagos. 1884, they occupied many areas in the Southern Protectorate and the Northern Protectorate. 1903 is when you see the modern day boundaries of Nigeria with the occupation of the British. In 1960, Nigeria gained its independence, but still carried some of those colonial marks with them. Whether it is evident to you or not, Nigeria's history spans eons longer than this colonial occupation. Please allow me to whet your appetite with a few names. Nak, Hausa, Borna, Yoruba, Oyo, Ife, Benin. Whether you see them as ethnic groups, states, kingdoms, or empires, understand that there is a history before the colonial occupation of the Niger area known as Nigeria. Hey y'all, welcome, welcome back. It was a pleasure beyond belief to talk about Nigeria. Of all the places that I desire to visit, that I want to visit, I've done work with, a lot of work with Nigerians. Um, and have done a few things uh, for people in Nigeria, just probably a lot of things for people in Nigeria. It, it comes as a, um, it brings a lot of satisfaction because I know that my, my DNA results are pretty much from coast of Guinea, pretty much, I mean, uh, Gulf of Guinea, so right there, that's where my ancestors pretty much come from. Exactly where, I don't know. Um, I know that I'm a combination of several things, and I brought it up so I could tell you, but I'm pretty much 85 to 90 percent from that area. Uh, 40 percent Nigerian, uh, 28 percent Cameroon, Congo, West Bantu people, uh, 10 percent Mali. You have uh, uh, Benin and Togo, 8 percent. If you even go down to the Ivory Coast, Ghana, you got 2 percent. So, you know, I'm literally 80, 85 to 90 percent that that whole coastal area right there, which would make sense because I'm an American descendant of slaves. Um, I am a black native here in America. I have many, many generations here. So it's a pleasure to learn about um, how colonization has had an impact on many of the nations. I mean, I've seen how it's had an impact on places like India, you know, and me spending a lot of time there. I've seen that before, you know, but then, then I, I, I don't always think about the impact in terms of Africa, you know, and, and them, the race to carve up Af Africa. And I think there's a, there's a second race right now trying to carve up Africa for its resources uh, that's occurring right now. Um, well, other countries are trying to get in for that race. So it, it is one of those things where it just brings me a lot of pleasure to be associated with Nigerians in any kind of way because I know that my ancestors come from there, come from those places, and, and they existed there before, you know, before people were being sent over um, and wherever they landed at. You know, I have a, I have a guy who... Um, and ended up having my same last name. And has my same name, period. He looks just like me. I mean, he looks just like me. He looks like he could be my kid. Um, and he has the same last name, but the, but the idea is that, you know, um, with that same last name, looks just like me, but he's not related to me whatsoever. Um, and I, and I, I tried to get him to take, actually, a, a DNA test, see if he would connect up with me in some kind of way. 
um, because we may we may have some ancestors that point directly to the same place. So definitely, it was a pleasure to talk about that. Um, so that makes me it makes my heart smile. Um, another thing that made my heart smile recently uh, to kind of bring take it off topic and bring it back to topic is there was this guy here in Texas uh, recently that a viral video happened where one of his neighbors uh, was berating him and telling him white lives matter, white lives matter, white lives matter. And, um, you know, he started spraying her with <laughs> his water hose. Now, do I promote violence or anything like that? I, I don't, but he's watering his yard and she's over there yelling at him. And he's just spraying her with the water. I mean, he has one of those uh, those actual um, hoses that, you know, sprinklers that kind of go back and forth. So he's just holding it and just putting water all on her. And she's coming after him, and it just is, you know, it's just, it gave me a good chuckle, right? But it, it brings it all to a certain place for me. Um, because when, when you think about that statement of black, and I don't even think the guy was black. When I looked at the video, I didn't notice he was black. I didn't notice him being black at all. He could have been, you know, I don't know, you know. Um, but the idea is this, right? Um, black lives matter period um but the thing about being an american a native black american for me american descendant of slavery you know being 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 here in this place right we have this way of not worrying at all about the world view we 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 have this thing where we just have this tendency to not be worried about the world view or to have a international type of perspective. Um, I'm guilty of that for sure. I'm guilty of that, that, that American way of thinking because I never had any connection with anyone outside of America, right? So I don't have any connection with anything that would remotely be outside of America, you know? I think about somebody like, um, you know, Pre President Obama. You know, his father was an African, no question, African, right? You know, I talked to some Ethiopians and, and, and some people from Africa and, and how they say they can trace their generations back. Ten years easy. Ten, ten generations easy, right? Ten generations easy. You know, and, and I don't have that, you know. As far as I can trace any of my generations back, it's going to be to the 1800s. It's going to be 40, 50 years prior to slavery at best. Um, you know, now, do I have uh, do I have some DNA that comes through Europe? I do, no question, right? But it kind of points toward Europe before Europe existed, right? So it could be from the Middle East. It could be from North Africa. It could be from, you know, because they don't like to call North Africa Africa. It could be from uh, from one of those other places there, right? Because I have this connection with a with a bunch of white folks. So obviously some you know, sneaky, freaky stuff happened at some point, right? Um, but as I since COVID has happened, um, I've had an opportunity to kind of look at myself more as a global citizen. You know, I have. Um, mentees that have come to me and especially one mentee comes to me and she's super concerned about Nigeria because she's from there and she wants to do many many things from Nigeria and everything else and you know I understand that and I help out any way that I can okay and, and, and those things I get right but but again that's that, that I don't have that connection now you know I don't um, I don't have any anybody who I call cousin or family just in a general sense right and so I, I have a connection with the south because that's where my folks are from but I don't have that from a global perspective anyplace else. And that's, that's one thing that we are missing as descendants of slaves. We're missing that. We're missing that wholeheartedly. For whatever reasons the slavery happened, um, we're completely missing that. So it's the erasing of everything that, that, that that's me um, that occurred. And I have to piecemeal together things in order to figure out what's what's a part of me, what feels comfortable, what, what anything, right? Now... I say that because it's the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, for whatever the organization is, is irrelevant to me. I support Black Lives Matter movement. 
um, but not necessarily from the organization perspective, from, from the ide ideological perspective, right? Um, and in supporting that, um, I have to also say to myself uh, something real simple, and it, it's come to my mind as I see things happen. It is that all lives matter. Yeah, but that's, that's no. What I, what's really important for me in remaining connected to the rest of you is for you to understand that all black lives matter. Okay? Now, I say that because I'm pointing out something really, really, really important. I'm not saying all American black lives matter. I'm saying all black lives matter. You know, across the diaspora, across the world, because they're part of this human race, period. Shouldn't be treated any differently any place where, where, where we are, where we exist. Because I am maybe a, a small little war, uh, capture, uh, kidnapping. I am one action away from being born here. You know, um, through the series of events, right? Uh, so, in my world, all black lives matter. And in saying that, I, I want to say to Nigerians, period, I support you. End SARS. End SWAT. Okay? I support you 10,000%. I wish I could help you. I want to help you. Okay? I want to help you, period. You know, we were doing a training um, over here. My, my colleague was training, and she was training for the, the mentee and doing some stuff for Nigeria. A bunch of girls they was doing this training for in Africa, and, you know, one of the, one of the students mentioned that it took her four hours to get to the class. Four hours. She didn't live four hours away. It took her four hours to get there. Why did it take her four hours to get there? Because there was a bunch of protests happening in the street. A bunch of protests happening in the street. Since October, there's been heavy protests happening in the streets of Nigeria. Heavy protests happening. Now, why are these heavy protests happening? Well, I had to do a little bit of research because I didn't quite understand or get it. It's something I've been looking into over the past week. And... I had a whole different topic. I'm over thinking about the right to vote and all this other things that's happening in America. And I was going to talk about actually voting. But man, screw voting right now. Screw voting right now. Screw that, right? I mean, you can cash your vote, right? You're living in a place where you can go and cash your vote and most of you own it but not run into any problems whatsoever. I get it. I completely understand that. It's true. I voted already. It's done and over with. But I'm still watching all the stuff that's happening with, you know, um, the Senate thing, you know, Amy, the Supreme Court, Amy Coney Barrett, you know, thinking about the, the the actual Senate, having a special meetings over the weekend to make sure they can push her through, right? I'm thinking about all these politics that happen in the United States of America, and you know what happens? Changes my life in no kind of way. Yeah, I get that voting is a tactic, I agree with that, but right now, I think our brothers and sisters over Nigeria need some help. They need some support. They need to see that we are supporting them, not just celebrities supporting them, because I see celebrities supporting them, right? I see celebrities jumping out the window and saying, hey, we support you, right? We support you. We support you, right? I see you see a lot of that stuff since this past Tuesday. Yeah, 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 yeah. What happened this past Tuesday? Well, we'll, we'll get into that. We'll get into that. But the statement is clearly all Black Lives Matter, period. There's no if, ands, or buts to that, period. So no matter where we are, all black lives matter. Now, let's talk. And, and I'm going to point towards certain things that I've written down here because it's important for me to get this right or as best as I can get it. And I stand to be corrected with anybody that can correct me. Um, because in me following up with friends from Nigeria, then uh, the truth of the matter is, you know, people in the government right now over there in Nigeria, they ain't hiding. You know, they, they are doing everything that they can to stay out of the, 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 the gunfire way, right? A lot of people are hiding. A lot of people are doing whatever they can to, 
to keep the status quo. They've been trying to change some things. I don't know. But the idea is that a lot of people sit there and hide and, and, and won't speak on this. But here's the deal. Um, when we're talking about SARS, in, in 1992, 1992 is the year I graduated from high school, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad, <laughs> understand, SARS, that's what it spells, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad was formed to combat armed robbery and other serious crimes, okay? Their powers included arrest, investigation, and prosecution of suspected armed robbers, murderers, kidnappers, hired assassins, and other suspected violent criminals. Okay? So in 1992, that's what happened. They were formed. Now, they, they weren't the first of these kind of groups that was formed in Nigeria, but when we're talking SARS, you know, specifically, I got to call out Nigeria because there is a SARS associated with uh, COVID, with, with, with COVID-19, a coronavirus uh, disease. So there is a SARS associated with that. But I'm not talking about that SARS. I'm talking about SARS, the Special Anti-Robbery Squad. Now, if, if we go back and, and, and kind of grab some of the history that we just talked about, right? Back in 1820, Nigeria formed its first police, okay? Its first police. It started to establish that in the north and in the south, okay? Uh, because they, they were looked at as separate protectorates or colonies slash protectorates or whatever they wanted to call them, right? Um, it's around 1930 that the Nigeria police force was formed merging across the northern and southern police, okay? Great. 1943, the Police Act was, I guess, approved where it set forth powers and duties of the police and gave them the extreme powers that they kind of have and they take advantage of to this very day. Um, around 1984 is where you start seeing these anti-robbery units start to exist in separate states. Um, I believe that there are a total of 36 states, but there's in the separate states, they start to exist. Obviously, 1992 is where you get the SARS version of this. And then by um, 10 years later, in two, 2002, that's when all 36 states of the Federation and the capital, they had a SARS unit. And the SARS unit is under the Nigerian Police Force Criminal Investigation and Intelligence Department. Okay? So that's just kind of pulling us back a little bit to understand where everything stands in reference to the history of Nigeria. So you have this special unit that is established. And um, obviously, they are doing some things that people are not good with. Uh, they are taking advantage of people, policing people, uh, in ways that are not good for humans to live under uh, these kind of conditions. Okay, So, when you're violating people's rights, it's a problem. It's a problem. So, literally October of this year, um, probably around October 4th, is when heavy protests started happening over there in Nigeria. Now, there's probably a few protests happening before that. There's more than likely in SARS movement before that. Uh, but this is when you start seeing the tags and everything else start to just kind of proliferate. And so, last week, October 20th, Army, police, these folks associated with SARS, fired shots into a crowd of protesters fired shots into a crowd of protesters, okay? Now, I don't know how many died from that, but to date, there are at least 12 people that have been killed, at least 12 that have been killed, and countless numbers have been injured in some kind of way by this police-slash-military SARS-type group. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people trying to fight something and trying to do what's right. And the government doesn't want to move in that direction. But it sounds like they've been forced to move in that direction. But you go back to a simple statement. Why, just why, oh why, oh why is this happening? No different than the United States of America. No different is really the erosion of trust 
in these institutions. Let me just, let me back it up for a second. Did we ever truly have trust in these institutions? I know from our perspective over here, the answer to that is no. No, no, no. But you trust in the dream of the possible, that people will do the right thing because there are people doing the right thing. You trust in that dream of the possible. But what happens when trust has been eroded in the entire system? Now, where is Nigeria in terms of this? I don't know. I, I just don't know. I don't know. But if I look at the United States of America, do I trust the executive branch, the legislative branch, the judicial branch? Do I trust either of them? Let's see. I got a president called Trump. No, I don't trust that dude. I don't trust that dude at all. Okay? Um, Central Park. All kinds of apartment complexes. New York, y'all got the whole story on him, man. No no doubt. Um, but I don't, I don't trust him at all. We, we talked earlier about how Pence <laughs> is running around still not masking up. And other people catching COVID, right? You know... It's like they didn't lost hope. They didn't, they're giving up. I don't know. But the idea is, though, I don't trust the executive branch. I don't. Okay? Legislative branch. Yeah, I don't trust them either, right? <laughs> I don't trust them either. Right? But why don't I trust them, though? Um, when you can get... And, and understand, I don't care about them getting the... Supreme Court nominee through. I don't really care, right? It, you know, there's nothing I can do about it. They're playing, you know, they 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 won under they won however they won, and they're playing under the rules that they're allowed to play under. And so when when the legislative branch can go ahead and hey man, we're gonna get her through this thing. So we're weak. We're about a week out from election, and and she's nominated. She's the, she's the next one that's going to sit on that seat, period. No question. Because they're banging out the votes right now. Guarantee you, there's only one person that has said up to the point that they're not going to vote that way. So she's going to be the Supreme Court justice. By this time tomorrow, um, by, you know, 9 o'clock tomorrow, noon, noon, noon on Tuesday of this week, she is definitely going to be the judge. So they're going to be celebrating that. No, no question, right? But they can do that. But yet, everybody wants to fight, push, blame about the um, stimulus package that many Americans are waiting for. You take other countries like Canada. You know, Canada, I heard, was given like $900 every couple weeks to their citizens. You talking about twelve hundred, and that's it. One time shot, okay. And the rich is getting richer in America, and the poor is getting poor. So I have a branch here that will do everything in their best interest. When they know they can do everything in their self interest, they will. But then in the other things, they want to blame everybody else. So I get it. I don't trust them. And again, again, the statement is, you know, I'm expressly talking about the Republicans, but. The truth is, the Democrats do the same thing. You know, so for this two-party system, it just don't work. It just really don't work. They have two options, and that's it. Okay, all right, so I get it. Why should I trust the judicial side? They have never apologized for some of the worst decisions ever made by courts, period. Plessy, pick them, pick them, and likely they interpret the laws in a way that don't help black folks. When you have the first 50 plus slave owners in terms of uh, Supreme Court justices, how does the South get all that land back? You know, these are these branches working together. So I got these three branches.
that work together. Not to mention that the, that the executive branch put on, literally, in terms of the federal courts across the nation, they've exchanged, they got 200 seats that they've exchanged and made sure was very conservative. Okay, And then, you know, when Biden gets elected, they, people talking about how he's going to increase the number of justices on the Supreme Court. You know, I just don't know what game they like to play, man. You know, and I'm not down for the games that they like to play. I'm really not because at the end of the day, it don't help America. It don't help America at all. It don't help us out, not us as the individuals that's on the street doing everyday work. Um, that's why I was so concerned about local, right? I was so concerned about local, but this national thing is, is working my nerves. It's just working my nerves. Now, to think to myself, the thing that we have in common with Nigeria is colonialism. We absolutely have that in common. The bigger difference is that that was a nation of black folk. This was a nation that white folks wanted to establish themselves. Yeah, and, that's, and I, I get it. I understand. Um, but that, that governing that they did, pulling resources out of Nigeria, the Nigerian police is an offshoot of colonialism. It's an offshoot of that. So what you have to understand that's important for us to kind of drive back in terms of these two places, we're not fighting. I'm not fighting white people. I'm not. I'm fighting white supremacy. That's what I'm fighting. I'm fighting white supremacy around the world. Or anybody's supremacy around the world. Because I'm not saying that black folks should just become supreme. I'm not even saying that. I'm not saying that at all. But I'm fighting white supremacy. And the colonious, colonial past that has happened to many of us. So what I have in common with all of you Nigerians, period, is we suffer under the same boot of colonialism. Now there may have been different directions that our countries have gone in for sure. But we are under that same boot of colonialism. I remember seeing that, that, that Cecil Rose picture of him, you know, having, you know, like a, a rope tied into, anchored into parts of Africa and his feet across both parts. I remember seeing, um, back in the day, seeing that in, in college, a picture like that, right? I, I remember seeing that, right? And that boot is on our neck, man. That knee is on our neck, right? It really, really is. And so I understand why the government over there in Nigeria is behaving the way that they are. It's not about black people treating black people like that. It's black people supporting and continuing the actual colonialist or the white supremacist regime. That's what they're doing. Even, even if there's no whites that are sitting there, just because you became independent doesn't mean you cured the nation of those problems, of those problems. Even thinking about Nigeria as a country by itself. Is Nigeria, Nigeria really a country that came together on its own? No, it's, it, it, it isn't. It isn't. It was forced together because of colonialism. That's it. That's it. So now as I, as I sit back and I, 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 I think about it, the common thread between them is the white nationalist agenda. Even though over there it's like you're, you're a puppet being held by it. You're a puppet being held by it. Because it's, it, you know, it's one of those things where any country that speaks English a whole lot, you probably have had the British there at some point. And if they were there, they weren't there just for the heck of it. They were there because they was siphoning resources from you in some kind of way. For Lugar to talk about the North being poor and the South being rich, he's talking about resources, man, more than anything else. So the point I'm making to you in this whole thing is we are completely with you. Because all black lives matter, period, around the world. So, I say it today. 
end, completely end the special anti-robbery squad. Period. Hashtag in SARS. In SWAT. Whatever they call SWAT. Whatever acronyms they're using for SWAT. And they're probably the same acronyms you use over here. Whatever acronyms they're using for SWAT, in that too. In that too. People should not be under a police state. Period. People should not be under a police state. And that is a democracy that is falling apart. America, look close. Because we, we ain't that far away from there. We're not that far away from there. And if Trump gets elected, boy, 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 you're going to have some troubles. You're going to have some troubles. Not because of Trump. It's because of you all that think like that. You know, I'm over here reading something, listening to something in the news, reading reading the news. And um, Starbucks barista has a, a Karen that comes in. And this Karen goes ahead and berates her. Berates her because she won't wear, because she won't wear a mask. She won't wear a mask. I mean, most establishments, when you walk through the door, they say you got to wear a mask. The, the, you know, I mean, what, the, what does the employee got to do with that? So she berates the employee, says the employee hates her because she's a Trump supporter. Uh, screw the company, screw her. And then she walks out the door and says, um, F Black Lives Matter. I mean, like the girl tweeted, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> you know, Black Lives Matter has nothing to do with any of that stuff whatsoever. So why is that a problem? Karen, why is it a problem? It shouldn't be a problem. Because in that instance, in Black Lives Matter had nothing to do with it. Just the woman serving you had to be happening even like, she may not even be supporting Black Lives Matter. For all we know. I, I doubt that, but the idea remains the same, right? So it's this, it's, it's this ignorance that's a problem. It's this trying to put yourself in a position where you're better than everybody else for no reason. Just no reason but because my skin is this color. I have the rights to be above you in some kind of way. That's a problem. And so I know that if we was to look a lot deeper into Nigeria, I guarantee you that if we did a nice study on there, we find that the behaviors coming out of this police force were the same hate behaviors that uh, happen in our police force. It comes from that colonialist, colonialist um, regime from back in the day. It comes from that white nationalist agenda. Period. So again, I say again, all, all black lives matter. Period. Again, are we saying somebody else's lives don't matter? You know better than that by now. You know better than that. That's the reason why I say to you, black folks in America, look, man, we got brothers and sisters around the world, period. We got brothers and sisters around the world. And, um, you know, I remember Killmonger talking about why, you know, they was going to use Wakandan technology to make sure that black folks pretty much is free around the world. And even though that, that's mythical and, and, you know, we'd love to have that. You know, in many ways, we don't want to go and conquer a whole bunch of other people just and do the same thing they did to us. It's not what most of us would want to do. I'm not saying all of us don't. That's not what I would want to do, okay? But the idea remains the same in that statement. We, as Native blacks, whether we do or we don't, or they do or they don't, we have something against each other. And it harkens back to that slavery, the transatlantic slave trade. It goes back there. And nobody's saying that different ethnic groups or states or empires or whatever weren't warring against each other. Yeah, there was wars in Africa. There's, there's differences in Africa. There's people fighting over those differences. We get that, right? We get that completely. I'm not saying that's never happened. I'm not saying that we've always been solid. But what I can say to you is this. They're playing on the same team. 
they're playing on the same team. They fight with each other. They fight with each other all the time. <laughs> they fight with each other all the time, right? You know, uh, those world wars would actually point that out more than anything else. So they fight with each other all the time, right? But when it's time for them to come together, they come together as them and then they go back to fighting. <laughs> they come together as their group of white folks and they come and they kind of split ways and then they fight later. We're going to have to come together. We're going to have to come together. Okay? I'm not saying to do the same thing that's been done to us. No, I'm not saying that at all. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is to make sure that we protect our futures. Make sure that we stop being on the defensive all the time and find ways to get on the offensive. Because sometimes a bully just needs to be punched in the mouth. And if we need to do that, we need to do that. But it is one of those things where it's like, wow. I see the same things happen over Nigeria that's happening here. The only difference is the skin color has changed, but the agenda that they support remains the same. So you got to understand that this thing ain't just about skin color people. It's about that agenda. And those agendas have been placed in our institutions. And the trust for those institutions are slowly eroding around the world. Period. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot in such a short period of time. That's a lot in such, such a short period of time. But I'm going to say to you, look, that's about where we're going to end it for today. I want to say to you, I do appreciate you taking the time to just hear me out, to listen, okay, to just listen. Uh, because these are just some of those thoughts, those things that I see happening in the world that I just want to just provide an opinion on. And, and you didn't have to listen to me. and You don't have to be here. I've stayed as long as you have stayed so far. But on that note, I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. And look, I know I'll be seeing you again really soon. Look out next week. I was going to talk about the right to vote this week. Um, but I, I really do think this whole thing with all Black Lives Matter is more important than us talking about voting. You know, yeah, you need to go vote. I agree with that, right? For you, you all as an American, you need to go vote. No question, right? And black folks are showing up in record numbers. No question. The line that I, the line that I was in, it was mostly black people, to be truthful. And I don't live in an all-black area. Trust me, I don't. And so, you know, it is important to vote. But, but alongside that vote, understand we do have the right to vote. We do want to take advantage of that. But there's some folks that don't have that right. There's some folks that look like us that, that, are, that are actually putting, putting that boot of colonialism on the necks of other people that look like us. And we need to change that. We need to change that. Okay? On that note, I'll say again, look, I look forward to seeing you next week. We'll be around here same time tomorrow. Hopefully get your week started off right. Other than that, I'll see you soon. Thanks for visiting the shop. You know there's absolutely no me without you. But before you walk out that door, make sure you visit us at endangeredspeciesunapologetically.com. You will find ways to stay connected with us. Take a look at our show notes, other episodes, bonus material, as well as that merchandise that you know Hustle Man got over there in the corner. When you're ready to break those chains, we got some stuff there for you to make your life better. However, as the old folks would say, be safe out there, young blood. See you next week.